Four o'clock on the dot, so I'm going to start right now because I've got a lot to cram into this. So uh, hopefully I've got some really interesting shit to go into with you guys. So I'm just going to go through the boring stuff first. First and foremost, this is me. Uh, before I got rid of the emo haircut, my name is James Mallison. I usually post things like that on Twitter if you like any sort of humour. And I currently work uh, for Trivago um, in Parma, Mallorca. And today I'm going to talk about, uh, well, first and foremost, I love PHP. That's why I'm here. So I love PHP so much that I, this is real, but it's not Photoshop. I bought this license plate for my bike, J77PHP. I was told, it's cut off a bit at the bottom, but I was told by members of the PHP community that now I've got that, don't crash for the sake of the PHP community because JavaScript developers will never let us hear the end of it. And then obviously here's me having crashed the bike three weeks later. <laughs> and today I'm going to talk about two things that I find really interesting. I'm going to talk about WebSockets. WebSockets because it's a non-traditional way of doing client-server communication, and I like doing things the way you're not supposed to. And, um, and torrents, because you, obviously you can do a load of illegal shit with torrents and download everything. Uh, I am not going to do any of that today, and, uh, uh, and obviously I haven't done that in the past um, <laughs> for r reasons. Um, so I'm going to talk about downloading the metadata of torrents. From the, and giving it from the server to the client. I'm going to talk about PHP, obviously, event-driven programming, non-blocking code, you know, things like that. And this is kind of the agenda that I'm going to go into. Um, so I'm going to show the story of my interest in WebSockets. I'm going to show uh, how I implemented the technology to, uh, to send arbitrary, or in my case, torrent JSON data from the server to the client. And the problem is that if you Google WebSocket tutorials, it will always be in the form of, say, a chat tutorial, which is sending information from the client to the server to the client. And that's boring, all right? Nobody wants to do that. People want to do push notifications, and push notifications tend to be arbitrary data. So hopefully at the end of this, I'll have shown you how I did it with torrent data, and then you can maybe use this as a, a learning experience to go and, and actually implement your own push notifications with your own arbitrary data. Um, also, I'm going to talk about some of the problems I encountered. I encountered authentication problems, blocking problems, and how I, how I solved them. And um, then I'm going to show you a demo. This, actually, this demo actually completely failed at PHP Northwest Conference um, because you can't torrent very well over 3G, apparently. And, uh, and I'm also going to show what I learned and, and how you can then move on and take the knowledge that you've got here and then go and do some really cool uh, WebSocket stuff in the future. So. Going on to the story, in 2012, I used to torrent shit ton at university. I mean, we had really fast download speeds at university. It was crap at home, great at university. So I downloaded a lot of completely legal torrents. So I used to take, say, 10 terabyte external hard drives, because, I mean, in, in those days, or oh, that's all I could afford as a, as a student. And um, I'd just take these hard drives into university, get everything downloaded and, and put onto these hard drives um, because of the good download speeds. So the next step for me was to get something kind of automated happening at home. So I installed something called DDWRT on my router. Now, this is actually before I knew what the difference between a router and a modem was. And you know, I just got my student loan. I wanted to buy something really shiny. And I saw this Asus router that was all black and had blue flashing lights. So I went and got that. Um, and I realized you could install DDWRT on it, which allowed me to SSH into my router. I could then install the whole LAMP stack, I could, which I did I, for no reason whatsoever. I served web pages from the router IP itself. Um, and also, I managed to install a torrent client. And there were two at the time that were kind of the main ones. There was Deluge, or Deluge, or however the hell you pronounce it, and Transmission. And Transmission was the easiest for me to install. Um, so I, I was a pretty hardcore Ubuntu torrent downloader. And there was also the option for me to plug an array of hard drives into the USB ports at the back of the router and have every movie or TV show that I'd ever watched automatically downloaded and transferred onto these hard drives. Uh, without me having to do anything apart from add the torrents. And uh, obviously, I didn't do that. that was just, it's just Ubuntu torrents. So this brings me to the, uh, the GUI of the transmission client. Um, so I was just finishing university, and I needed a use case to be able to show potential employers, you know, I can do some good shit. And I also like to torrent a lot. So I, I figured I want to put these two things together. And when you look at the, the transmission GUI over here, it looks like a proper web application. But if you right-click and inspect element, you'll just see it's, it's, it's not an application. It's just a load of CSS, and it's a horrible CSS framework. And there's, these buttons are little icons. And it's, it's just you know anyone could make something so much better than this. So I figured that the data must come from somewhere and be populating this kind of horrible CSS over here and the, the HTML. 
So I had the idea that I would use Bootstrap Framework, Bootstrap CSS, because it has nice uh, progress bars, and you, can, you, know, you can change the, the style attribute and have this progress bar go up, depending on whether or not uh, a torrent's downloading. And I would need to get the information from the server to the client in a standardized format like uh, JSON or you know, if I was really, really miserable uh, XML, which I didn't do. I was definitely JSON. Um, so the first solution that I came up with uh, was, I mean, you don't really see exactly what's going on here, but at the very bottom, I'm just doing this horrible command line call, which gave me all of this crap. And then I, got, I basically had to use some of the JSON from near the bottom of this, this output, as well as the columns from the very bottom of the output, and put them together to get exactly what I needed. So what I ended up doing was doing a horrible regex, manually interpolating brackets and quotes to make my own JSON. And I mean, I was a graduate, so this was, the, this was clearly the best way of doing it as soon as I got it working. And then, so basically it worked. It took five to 10 seconds. It was really slow and crap, but it worked. So um, basically, this was kind of the over, overall kind of standard how you would send an AJAX request to the server and get the response. This is what my application did to get this information back. Obviously, the browser makes an AJAX request to the server. The server runs the command line call, and then that would return the JSON to uh, the browser. So this proof of concept that I turned into a prototype and then became my final idea, obviously, as it always happens like that in business, um, it worked. I was really proud of what I'd done. So clearly, the best thing that I could do at this time would be go to some of the nicest people on the planet, Stack Overflow, and show them what I've done. And I was you know, really proud. I was like, guys, Stack Overflow guys, look what I've done. What do you think? And this was the response that I got. <laughs> and as usual, it was absolutely nothing to do, first and foremost, with my code. They didn't tell me anything about my code. They said that I was exposing myself and my unnaturally large amount of Ubuntu 12.04 downloads to the world. So I needed another server somewhere else, somewhere else in the world, as far away east as possible, preferably, that I could connect to and talk to anonymously so Ubuntu couldn't see how many of the torrents I was downloading. And where, where better than Stockholm, Sweden, which is actually where the Pirate Bay data centers were. This was the logic that was in my head at the time. Um, <laughs> what wasn't in my head at the time was this was actually where they were raided by the police. Like, oh, I didn't realize that. But anyway, I found a VPS provider over there, and I needed to pay for that. So I'm a biker. You've seen the bike crash pictures at the beginning. And so I have the helmet and the full leather gear and everything. And in Preston, this is related, in Preston, where I worked before, um, there was actually a petrol station around the corner where you could buy an anonymous debit card or credit card. I can't remember which one it was. But the point is that you go in, you pay £10, and then you get this anonymous credit card that you can then use to buy, to get, you know, to get PayPal or anything you want. And you can use this card to then pay for whatever you want online. So I wore all this gear, went into the petrol station, but obviously parked my bike around the corner. And all this was for educational purposes only, obviously. Um, <laughs> went and got this prepaid credit card, came out, went, went home, and then I connected to the uh, VPS provider's website using Tor. So then when I bought or, or rented the VPS, they couldn't see where I was renting that from. So I effectively got this VPS um, really cheap and theoretically anonymously. Which brings me to kind of the next version of what I did with my little uh, educational project. So the browser makes an AJAX request to my server like normal, but then my server would SSH to the, the virtual private server using an application called Torify, so it does it over Tor. I think I used PHP Seclib at one point as well, if anyone's heard of that, because it had some secure SSH implementation that I found was really useful. Um, but then it was the virtual private server that... that um, Shit, I'm seeing pictures of people taking pictures of this. I don't know if I should just... <laughs> anyway, <laughs> educational. Um, so then the uh, VPS over in the east would run the torrents and all that stuff and then return that information over SSH to my server, and then that server would uh, return the information to the browser. So it worked. This was my next step. I'd done exactly what the Stack Overflow guys, uh, Stack Overflow guys asked for. Um, so I went back to Stack Overflow really proud. I was like, guys, I've done exactly what you said. What do you think? And this was the response that I got. <laughs> and finally, they gave me something really useful about my code, my technology, my architecture. And they said, dude, why don't you just use WebSockets? So they didn't tell me why I should use WebSockets, obviously. They just said, use WebSockets. It's like going in there, asking a question about Symfony, and they just say, oh, don't use a framework. Thanks, guys. But anyway, so I went there. Um, well, I went away from there. I did some research. And this is what I found out about WebSockets. Now, this isn't going to be just uh, a WebSocket talk, because you can have someone stand and, and talk an hour on WebSockets, uh, specifically how to or what they are. But I'm just going to skim over kind of the how things happen, and then I'm going to go more in depth into it. So 
The browser initially sends a WebSocket or WSS request. The, the WSS is a secure version from the client to the server. You, you type in WebSockets, you'll find this on images on Google. It's really easy to find. Um, the server responds with a HTTP 1.1 switching protocols. As long as your server uh, allows this, then it does this automatically. You don't need to worry about this. So, so far, apart from requiring the JavaScript library to, to send this, um, you don't need to worry about how it does it. It just does. And then from then on, you've got this big fat pipe, this open TCP connection, which is where the data can be sent bidirectionally either way. And what you have to do then is use that to choose when to send information to the server and when the server will send information to the client. And that's what I'm going to show you in a little bit how I did that. And the important thing to note is that the connection can be closed at any time on either end, and either end has to choose how to uh, respond to that. So if the uh, server closes down, typically the JavaScript library will try and reconnect every five seconds and then fall back to Ajax or something like that. If the, uh, if the um, client disconnects by going to another page that doesn't have the WebSocket call on or just closing the browser, the server will typically automatically have to respond to that and it will uh, remove that client from its internal array of clients that it's sending information to. So it's basically saying, we're not going to send any information to you anymore. And this is done in PHP, which you'll also see in a little bit. So standard HTTP versus WebSockets. HTTP, everyone knows this, you, you send a request to the server, you get a response from the server, and then uh, that's it. It's half duplex. So you have to wait for a response and then, and then rinse and repeat. So if you're doing this every five seconds to get this torrent data, it's polling. Now, WebSockets, you've got to have something open on the server, which is called an event loop that's going around and around and around, um, that's waiting to have information given to it and waiting to send information out, but it's really fast. Um, and this is full duplex. So you've got to have this big pipe going between the client and the server, and you've got this loop happening on the server. So what do I mean by quickly, very quickly, by half duplex and full duplex? So half duplex means, in HTTP, in a conversation, um, only one person can talk at once, and the other person has to listen and wait to give a response. So if you're using Apache or Nginx or something like that, this is where you send the requesting and then get the response. Full duplex is this event loop, uh, which is where, in a conversation, everyone's able to talk to each other at once, like PHP internals. And everyone's able to understand what each other is saying at the same time. Not like PHP internals. <laughs> I think someone already knew what I was going to say there. So uh, I've mentioned this word event loop. So very briefly, what is an event loop and how does it work? So the point of an event loop is this loop that's happening on the server. And it's not just a while loop. And I'll explain why in a second. But basically, the point is a request comes in to this event loop. Um, then a, uh, an, a, you're registering an interest in receiving some data. So the, the actual processing of all this, like I.O. operations, which typically are blocking, database calls, uh, all that sort of stuff, is handled outside of the event loop. And then once it's done, it's kind of injected back into the event loop, and then that callback is triggered, and, and the response is returned to the person who sent the request. So it's not just a standard request or response. Um, going on to a little bit more in depth about event loops, I really like this diagram. It's from Embedded Systems. Um, and the point of event loops in a single-threaded context is that it's not just a while loop. If you guys were to try and implement, or any of us trying to implement a while loop, you'd have at the top of your while loop procedurally, in a procedural sense, is there anyone trying to connect? You would say there is people trying to connect, then you'd, you'd save the people into an internal array somewhere. And then you'd do all your processing in the middle that needs to be done, and then at the end of your while loop, you would say, okay, is there any information that needs to be sent out? So it's not just a while loop. That's polling in a procedural sense. So that's also blocking, because all of the information that happens in between, you can't have anyone else register an interest in receiving information. You can't send any information out while this computation is happening. <coughs> so instead, we can use something called interrupt-driven I.O. So with interrupt-driven I.O., this is kind of a bit more in-depth. You don't need to worry about it, because it just happens when you use the technology to do all this WebSocket stuff. But the point is that a flag is set on the CPU, so this uh, big event loop can continue happening continue going around, but the process is that has, is getting all this information, it's suspended, and then the buffer is filled, saying, all right, we're going to make a database call that takes ages. And then finally, once we, once we get this information, that information then changes a the flag back, and it's then put back into the event loop. So the point is that the event loop isn't saying, have you finished yet? Have you finished yet? Have you finished yet? It's the source of the data that, that just says to the event loop, yes, we've finished. And the point, the, the reason I'm showing you this is because it's you need, we need to get out of the mindset today of procedural code. We're going to talk about jumping around, which is what it allows you to do with an event loop. Um, 
And this is useful for inter-process communication because another process can change this flag and then put stuff into the event loop. And you'll actually see me do that in the live demo that hopefully won't completely screw up later on. Um, also, this is how PHP's process control extension works a little bit because it's signal-based. So I'm going to show you a very brief uh, example of PHP's process control extension and how to use it, and then hopefully that'll see how we're moving away from procedural to this kind of jump, <laughs> jumping around stuff. So I'm going to go through this line by line first. Ignore declare ticks. I'll explain what that happens at the end, uh, why that happens at the end. So we've declared a random function, a signal handler. Don't have anything in it. You could echo something out. Do whatever the hell you want. Then, once you've got the process control uh, extension installed with PHP, um, you have to say that process control signal, if we receive a SIG term, then we're going to run the signal handler. That's the next line. The signal handler is the name of the function. Um, a SIG term in Linux is a minus 15. So if you run this script, um, you see at the bottom we've got a while true. It sleeps for 10 seconds each time and then just keeps sleeping. This, you run the script, it'll just sleep forever. It'll echo a process ID out so we know which one we want to kill, but then it'll sleep forever. So, run that script in a terminal, wrap it up here, it's fine, open another terminal. Then when you do a kill minus 15 of that process ID or the script or whatever, the, the minus 15 is the sig term. If you do a kill minus 9, that's a sig kill and it'll just immediately kill this, this process. But the 15 means that it's a sig term, a termination, and then um, wherever we are in that while loop, this is the important bit now. Even if we're in the middle of this sleep call, which takes 10 seconds, it will seemingly immediately jump from this sleep straight into that signal handler. That's, that's the magic, basically. And um, the reason this happens is because we've got this declare ticks at the top. And this works because the underlying operating system sleep call is interruptible. I mean, if you go into PHP sleep and then you see the C library call that it's doing, it's interruptible. So declare ticks effectively tells PHP under the hood to poll for interrupts. So PHP is still doing polling, but you don't see it because it's not in user land. So under the hood, after each executable low-level function call that has side effects that PHP does, PHP polls, is there an interrupt? And if there is, that's why it jumps to the signal handler. So you, if you don't declare this, do this declare ticks, then uh, it won't execute the tick function, and then it won't jump to the signal handler and with, with the minus 15 that you sent. So, so why am I showing this? I want you just to see how we can jump from something that's seemingly doing something to somewhere else at any time. I've seen DevOps use this to uh, send a minus 15 and then turn off a load of AWS instances, um, shut down a load of AWS instances by, uh, by an API call before terminating the program. So the library that I used for this event loop and you'll actually see this jumping around in a second that I've shown with the process control extension, was <coughs> React. And this was a while ago. There's, there's newer ones now. But I used React, which is primarily the event loop that I showed you. It has HTTP DNS components and Ratchet, which is a WebSocket implementation on top of React. So before we get worried about how many tech things I've just, ta I've just talked about, literally that is the end of the tech stack pretty much. You've got your standard server and you've got your standard JavaScript. You've got a library in JavaScript that allows you to make this WebSocket call, and then you've got React, which is your event loop, and React Ratchet, which is your WebSocket implementation on the server. So you've got those two things on the server, and you've got these, these two things on the client. That's, that's it. So you don't need to think, there's so much stuff here. That's, that's it for the tech stack. So React is a PHP implementation of an event loop that uses uh, select calls by default, which is, is really slow, system select calls. And that's why React and AMP PHP and other PHP implementations of event loops say, please install, if you can, libevent or libev. And libevent and libev are C, uh, cross-platform C implementations of the event loop. So effectively, when you call interface methods on this library, if you have these uh, libraries installed, then it will choose to use libevent or libev, and if you don't, then it will fall back to the, the crappy, slower PHP version of this, of this event loop. And that's why libraries suggest that you uh, use these interrupt-driven I.O. sort of allowing C-based libraries, um, because they're a hell of a lot more performant. So, very shortly, we're going to get into some code. The point with Ratchet is you need to create an event handler. This event handler class is the thing that handles all your events. So you've got to have methods like onSubscribe. This is, these are the interface methods, onSubscribe. So a user is subscribing to receive torrents whenever we have anything to send out to them. OnOpen is called when, uh, when we open a connection from the client to the server. There's about five interface methods or something like that yeah, that you have to implement. Um, once we've created this event handler class, we tell Ratchet, this is the event handler class, 
And then you type php index.php, hit end to remove this terminal to the top left, like we did with the process control extension thing. So it's ready to handle events, and then it just sits open, and then you can start doing your clever shit in JavaScript. So this code is copied directly from the Ratchet documentation. After this today, you can just copy and paste some code, and theoretically, you should be able to start doing some cool stuff. The only thing we've changed here is this our event handler class up here. This is the thing that we have to create that contains on subscribe and on open. Once we've done this, we've got the loop run at the bottom. We hit enter, like I said, move this terminal to the top left. And uh, then when JavaScript calls dot subscribe, then our event handler class on subscribe is called. And we can do loads of cool stuff in there. So implementation time. I'm going to show you the WAMP spec, which contains those methods that I've just said on open, on subscribe, that you have to implement. And I'm going to show you how you make the JavaScript library calls to make that event happen, how you trigger those events. Um, and that's basically how we keep everything connected because of the spec. And this is the WAMP spec, which is a sub-protocol that provides RPC and pub sub patterns. You don't need to worry too much about that. But in this, in, this is an interface that you have to implement. And then you have to have on open, on close, on subscribe, all that sort of stuff. And you have to handle what happens in your event handler. So in my case, uh, we have the concept of a topic here. You can see one of these things on subscribe. We have a concept of a topic. And in my case, the topic was just the string torrents. So uh, the, the JavaScript implementation, uh, the library that allows us to adhere to this WAMP spec was autoban.js. That's the JavaScript library. And we have these methods on the server. That's how the connection works. So first and foremost, at the very top, we've got on open. This is the WAMP spec thing. Because we're implementing WAMP server interface, um, that this is what you have to have. So I've closed this on subscribe here and this on close here. We've got this on open. That's the one that you're going to care about now. So what we're doing here is we're basically saying that when someone opens a connection to our event loop, this handler gets on open gets executed for us. And we get a connection interface object. So then we store this connection object in our internal array of clients, which is this thing up here. So what I want to point out here is that this is just a class. This is just a standard class. So you, I've got this logger here. I've removed the constructor. but you can just put a new, a, you know, a new monologue logger as in the constructor and dependency inject stuff in. This is just a standard class. The only difference that you'll see here from standard programming is that this thing contains state. So that every time someone connects and disconnects, there's not a new class each time because you've already hit enter in the terminal and you're running this thing in the top left. You'll have that array of clients opening and closing, and there's always going to be state in this class. So. This is, this is really simple. This is the on open. And I'm going to show you the JavaScript that causes this to be jumped to and executed. So I've moved that to the top of the screen. You don't need to care about that. Now you can see this is the only JavaScript you need to, uh, to make that on open execute in your event loop. So we're making a call to this URL over WebSockets, not the secure one, just the standard one. We actually call, on op or we actually call open. And when the on open succeeds, we get a session object. That, that's literally the code to make someone connect and to be able to store that IP address or whatever the client ID is in the internal array of clients. Yeah? Uh, that's the JavaScript library that conforms to that spec that, that allows you to call open and have on open called on the server. That's the, the thing that allows that to be, to be the same. So that WAMP spec that I showed before, this one, that's the JavaScript library that allows these to talk to JavaScript. So that's it. Those are the two things to make on open happen. <laughs> And this is kind of the same with subscribe. So I've closed on open here, and I've called on subscribe. We have the connection, and we have a topic. In my case, topic was torrents. So the only thing I've done different here, it's a little bit more complicated, but we've got this uh, a loop add periodic timer. And the only thing I've got this loop from is by passing the event loop, which is an object that you create at the very beginning of this application. I've dependency injected that into this uh, event handler. So I've passed it in. It has methods on it like add periodic timer. In this case, every two seconds, we're going to make a horrible command line call to go and get that torrent data. And then once I've got that torrent data, I can broadcast that data back to everyone subscribed to that topic. And I'll put these slides online. It's really easy to, really easy to do this. There's other methods as well. But you get a timer object from, back from that. So I'm storing the timer and the topic and the client connection ID together for every single person that's connected. So then we can remove someone from the internal array of clients, which means we're not going to send any information out to them anymore um, when we call on unsubscribe. 
Uh, we can uh, call methods on that timer object like stop or pause and things like that. And then uh, the topic is just, in my case, it was the string torrents, so we know who subscribed to torrents. So um, this is the same as on open. This is the JavaScript that the only thing that's changed here to make this happen is with the session object we get back from on open, we call subscribe on it. So we're subscribing to the topic torrents, and whenever we get some result back, we'll console logging totally legal torrent data, and then the result. So that hopefully that's really easy to understand. We've got this. Uh, this thing is constantly looping around over and over, and whenever we call this from JavaScript, this onSubscribe method is called. And then we start every two seconds a timer on that to send the information out. So before I continue, I want to show how easy it is to run this event loop and uh, Apache on the same server, because this is a problem you need to, need to be concerned with, because this, is, uh, this event loop is running on an IP address and a port, so because it is a server, effectively. So you've got to make sure that WebSocket calls go to the event handler, and your HTTP calls go to Apache. So all it is, I think this was the only line, maybe one more line, but this was the only line that I needed to add to my virtual host, proxy pass, which states that WebSocket secure calls, or WebSocket calls, go to the event handler instead, running on this port. And you set up the IP address and port that they're running on when you hit enter in that terminal in the code up there. Or just use Nginx, because it's a lot easier to do, apparently. So kind of the, now the high-level architecture or data flow, or whatever you want to call it, of this working is you subscribe to a topic in JavaScript, dot subscribe. You're calling with autoban.js library. We're subscribing to the torrents topic. Then on subscribe is called automatically for us in the event handler, uh, which is where we store the connection of the person that's connected in an internal array. We start the timer every two seconds for that person using add periodic timer. And then we store that timer against that connection in the internal client's array as well. Every two seconds, the timer is hit. We uh, get that torrent data by the horrible command line call. And then this takes ages, because it's crap at the moment. And you'll see why that's a problem in a little bit. Then we broadcast that data back to the, server, uh, back to the client. And then when the, when the person navigates away from the web page on unsubscribe, it's called automatically for us. Or the, uh, in your JavaScript, you have a button that says unsubscribe that executes dot unsubscribe, which then executes on unsubscribe in the event handler then uh, we, have to do, we have to do the cleanup, which is stop the timer. We do an array search in the internal array of clients to find the person that's unsubscribing. We uh, stop the timer for that connection, and then remove that connection from the internal array of clients. So this is kind of the life cycle of having someone connecting, registering an interest in receiving torrent data, starting the timer to send that to that person who's interested in it, and then removing that from the internal array of, of clients when they unsubs unsubscribe. And in our case, we just console logged the information that came from the server to the client. So there was a few problems with this implementation uh, that I came across. And the first one was that I was subscribing to the string torrent. I had this grand idea that me and all my mates could use this application that I was building to be able to have their own individual torrents. So if everyone was subscribing to torrents, the next person that opened a window on another computer, they'd be getting everyone else's torrent data. It's not on a per user and per connection basis. So my plan was to, in a MySQL database, store a user ID next to a torrent hash, still do that call to get all the torrent data, but then filter it for the uh, user ID that has those torrents, and then only return that user's torrents to the client. So this, just the string torrents, meant that it wasn't on a per user and per connection basis. Um, and also, if I was to open a browser window to ask for this information to be sent to me, and then I open another browser window, the exact same one, basically, with the same web page, then that periodic timer will be started again for the same person, so then both web pages will constantly be getting this, basically double the speed of the, of the torrent data. So, yeah, that, that was a big fail. So the way I fixed that, kind of a hack, as most of this was basically a hack, was the topic has to be a string. And you know what? Fuck it. JSON's a string. So I basically put structured data in JSON and sent that as the topic. So the topic was torrents, and the user ID was the uh, user ID I got from PHP, and I gave to a JavaScript variable, which I then used to subscribe to a WebSocket thing. So now, every subscription would be unique for user ID. So uh, user ID 245 opens a browser window, user, user 247 opens a browser window, and they will each have their own torrent data um, sent to them every two seconds, because that topic string is different for each of those people. 
But the problem is that with this, the same user could still open another web page. It works for different users, but the same user could still open another web page, and then they'll still get double the amount of information back because the uh, topic string, which contains the topic and the user ID, will be exactly the same. So uh, they're, they're basically subscribing twice on both of their pages. So I got around this with a sort of authentication duplicate data solution. So I was passing, the problem was I was passing the user ID to uh, a JavaScript variable and then subscribing to the torrents um, topic. But if you were to pause JavaScript execute, I don't even know why I was worrying about this because my mates weren't going to fuck around with my code. Well, actually, we're all computer students, so we probably would. But um, I don't know, I would. But uh, basically, one of my mates could pause the execution of the JavaScript, change that user, na user ID, and then click play, and then they would get someone else's torrent data if they could guess the user ID. And I was using auto increment, so obviously they'd, they'd eventually find someone else's uh, data. So the way I got around this was to do something really stupid and really clever, which was basically reinvent how PHP did sessions. Great. So I would create a unique token on the server, and I would pass that to the JavaScript before making the WebSocket call. This unique token, I used random bytes, which is, a, uh, well, I would use random bytes because PHP didn't, 7 didn't exist back then, but uh, I'd use random bytes instead of uh, open SSL random pseudo bytes because that's not fork safe, um, <coughs> because security was a big concern in this application. Um, <laughs> I'd pass the topic then. So, so now I've gone from the, uh, the topic and the user ID being sent up for, a, uh, for, uh, for asking for torrents. It would then contain a unique token if you refresh this page every time, you get a different token in the JavaScript variable. So if one user, user 245 in this example, um, was to open a second page and have subscribe to torrents, that string would then have a different token in, so then they would be getting individual torrent data instead. So we're not having one page affect another, so they're not having double the data sent back. Now, I know Ratchet at this point had uh, a sessions component that worked with Symfony. I, ne I never even used it, but I know if you have HTTP foundation in your, in your application, then you can um, basically plug and play that. But I didn't do that. I just used this, 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 what I thought was a really simple solution. The biggest problem out of all of this, though, was that it, it was blocking. So this stupid five-second call that it took to get the torrent data, during that time, because this event loop was basically blocked, it was waiting for a response, then uh, no one else could register an interest in receiving torrent data. No one else could have that torrent data sent to them. Um, no one else, so nobody could call dot .subscribe in the JavaScript and have unsubscribe called in the event loop automatically for them. They'd have to wait until this five-second bloody command line call finished. So it's blocking. And it's the same for database, database calls. I was checking on the server side in the event loop that the user who sent up the ID and token was the same as what was in the database. And if they weren't, then I'd, I'd just say, I'm not going to add you to the internal array of clients, which means you're not going to get any information sent out to you. So the way around this blocking solution that I found was you could either use another process to run that um, torrent call. So it's in a child somewhere. The event loop can keep continuing or use a job queue. Now, I really like the job queue solution, and I'll show you both of these within the next couple of minutes. But it requires a good architecture to make sure that your job queue is completely separate from your, uh, from your application, but then it still knows where to send the data back to. And I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show you all that soon. So, option one. In on, um, on subscribe, uh, you can do this. Create a new child process, which contains our horrible command line call, and then you add a timer to that, and then you start the timer, and then when data is given, that's when you then broadcast it back to the client. So you can say, on STD out, um, when we get data, send it out. And this is, this is great, because uh, this meant that the event loop could then continue, so it wasn't blocking anymore. So the, uh, the downside of this is this is a process, and it only works on your machine. So it's not a particularly scalable solution. I have no idea why I was even considering this, because there was only about eight of us who were going to use it, so it didn't really matter. But basically, uh, you're spawning a new process every time someone asks for torrent data, every five seconds for every client. And there's a lot of overhead in creating a new process. So you've got things like memory allocation, file descriptors, file handlers, all of this Linux bollocks that nobody understands and I don't understand. Um, but a process is effectively the biggest unit of execution within an operating system. So it requires the most resources. So it's not the best way unless you're doing like shitty little projects. And I envisioned this huge, awesome, completely legal system of downloading <laughs> torrents. 
So the next step was to use a job queue. So the point is that I would then fire off the request for this torrent data into a job queue, wait for it to finish, although the event loop can keep continuing, and then put that back into the uh, job queue. Rather like that diagram I showed at the beginning, which has the event loop in the middle, the, uh, all the blocking I.O. stuff outside of the event loop, and then the request going into the event loop uh, asking for the information. So when you set up your uh, ratchet and all that event loop and you hit enter and move it to the top left, this is where you put this code at the very top here. And all we say here, which you can also copy and paste from the documentation, when we get information sent to us from anywhere on this machine, on port 5555, then it's going to call on ZMQ response, a function that doesn't exist yet. We're going to create it in a second in our event handler. So any information that comes over port 5555 hits our method automatically for us. This is what this code's saying. So in our onSubscribe method, when someone asks for, for uh, torrents, I'm using this thing called Feenstalk. Now, this, this talk isn't about a job queue. There's a, a talk that I link to at the end, which is really cool about uh, creating workers that are object-oriented, and they all adhere to nice, good, solid principles and all that, but I'm not going to talk about that. But basically, this is basically the only line that I would need to add into my onSubscribe method. Put that job shit into a torrent queue. That's it. And then forget about it. So it's a fire and forget. That's the important thing. So, looking at our new method that we've created here, this on ZMQ response thing down at the bottom, the point of this is that any information that's sent over port 555 hits this method. We just get some random arbitrary data. So if I was to set this up now, you guys could all send messages over this IP address, port 5555, um, as long as you use ZMQ or the right library, and you'll see that in a second as well, saying, oh, your talk is shit, or whatever you want to say, and then it would pop up on the screen if I ever wanted to show it. So all we do is we find the client that we want to uh, send the information to and then broadcast the data to the client. So this is how easy it is to inject stuff back into the job queue. So the high level kind of data flow and architecture of the new way is you subscribe in JavaScript to uh, torrents. It automatically calls on subscribe for us in uh, like, like before but we store that connection in an internal array like, like before but instead we then use Feenstalk just add it to a job queue, or whatever job queue you want to use, fire and forget, forget about it. Then, you have all these workers, as many as you want, that pull that job out of the job queue, do all the processing, so they do this horrible command line call that takes ages. When they're finally done, they send that data over port 5555, and it gets injected back into the event, queue, uh, uh, the event loop onto our, into our onZMQ response method that we've just created here. That's how we get stuff back into the event queue from somewhere else. And this is a worker that's doing it, but you can do a command line call or whatever hell you want. You'll see me do a command line call in a second. And then we broadcast that data back to the client. So this is separating the processing, like that diagram I showed you at the beginning, all the intensive operations. We're throwing that into a job queue, getting the workers to do its shit, and then inject that back into the, uh, into the job queue when it's done, which is then broadcasted to the client. And the good thing about this is this adheres to kind of the original idea that I brought up at the beginning. The event loop is just an intermediary for registering an interest in receiving data and sending data out. That's it. Nobody's blocked from registering interest because this work is all done outside of the event loop. And workers, as long as they have Beanstalk D and uh, Zero MQ, of which there are so many languages that support all this stuff, workers can be in any of these languages, which is really cool. So this is the part that completely fucked up last time. So please turn off all your torrents so I can actually show you some completely legal stuff. Yeah, great. Okay, torrents on the right, completely legal stuff. As you can see, we've got this Ubuntu stuff happening over here that's currently paused. Now, this is the application that I created for me and my friends uh, from uh, a theme that I bought online, of course. And also, <laughs> shit, hold on. Ignore the bit that says your streamable videos. So I'm going to click Downloads over here. And also, the important thing that I need to do is show you my code. This is the code that you saw at the very beginning, where, well, near the beginning, which is actually starting this uh, event loop. So I hit Enter on the WebSocket server. I move this to terminal to the top left. I'm using PHP Storm here, but that's all you need to do. And then log, I've got WebSocket server starting. That's just me logging something out when I, uh, when I start this. So if I repress this downloads page now, oh yes, nobody's torrenting, just me, perfect. So the important thing to see, oh God, it's cutting off at the bottom. Okay, so these tor this torrent information here is actually that thing that's getting pushed to us every two seconds. 
So the only thing you need to worry about here is it says paused for all these torrents because they are paused. So going back to these, if I resume them and ruin everyone else's talks and then go back to this, now you can see that that information now says uh, downloading. So that information has changed because every two seconds it's getting this torrent data and pushing it. And the cool thing is if I show you the network for this, I close this, even though that information is being pushed to us two seconds, every two seconds, there's no information in this network thing because it's over web sockets. And then if I pause these again, and then go back to this and go back to the console, you can see how when it comes up, from, it changes from downloading to paused in the JSON, which I thought was really cool. You know, this is, we've basically eliminated the overhead of the, the HTTP request. We're just having data pushed to us now. So going back to the code, I want to show you how I then inject stuff back into the event loop and get it working. These are the four lines of ZMQ stuff that I needed to add. And if you remember that on ZMQ response thing, well, I've created, yesterday I did this, I've said anything over port 555 hits on terminal test, a method that I'm just about to show you that I've added in my event handler. On terminal test, I've called it that because I'm going to do it from terminal to send this stuff into the event loop. It, we loop around all of the clients that are connected, get the topic object, I've called it original topic, and then we broadcast the data that gets sent in over port 555 to everyone that's subscribed to topic, to that topic. So here is the only code that I need to get that stuff injected into the event loop. So this is the code that you would use for your workers to put stuff back into that event loop. So Hopefully it's working. So we're saying that everything that gets, every, we're going to say that we're going to push this information over port 555, um, and this is the data here. We're just JSON encoding it because everything's JSON encoded. And I'm going to call php terminal test.php. I'm going to hit enter, done, bam. Your worker would do that. So then if we look at this uh, stuff that's coming through from the uh, server, you can see here, we're sending some data here where it's working, and then everything else continues. So we can inject stuff whenever we want while this big fat pipe's open and this loop's going around over and over and over, which is really cool. So that's how we inject stuff back into the event loop. Um, and the, the demo didn't fail, which is pretty cool. OK, and, and now we're done. Okay. OK, so what about scaling? OK, I was in the previous talk, and they talked a bit about HA proxy, which I've honestly never used. So um, this is one way you could scale, theoretically, uh, in your own code. So you could write this, have complete control of scaling these event loops, and uh, this is one way you could do it. So your client, your JavaScript client, or however you want to do it, could call an API. It would uh, talk to a database or Redis, which contains a list of all your event loops. Now, event loops are really performant. You'll only need to do this if you've got a shit ton happening in these event loops. But you can scale these things. The uh, database can either round robin through these IP addresses that you want to connect to, or, just, or random, do a, a rand to choose between them, or you could do that on ZMQ response thing and ask each event loop how many clients do you have connected, and then choose the one with the lowest number of clients connected. So once you've figured out which one you want to choose, you then call that chosen WebSocket server. I think this is going to be cut off at the top. No, just about. The event loop then. Um, puts that torrent thing into the queue. The, the uh, worker picks up that, does whatever it needs to do to make that torrent call happen. And when it's finally done, it sends the information back over 0MQ <clears throat> and, then, uh, and then broadcasts it back to the client. And this is scalable. And the reason this is scalable is because you can add a new event loop, um, set it up, get your DevOps guys to bring it up, add that IP address of the event loop and the port or whatever, to your database, so the next client connecting, uh, that event loop automatically becomes a part of the decision-making process for, uh, for which event loop to choose. And then you can add and scale workers, and it's, really, it's pretty cool. So basically, you can do this, and you'd be in control of the logic for scaling your shit. But we're still polling on the server, you say. We're still um, doing a two-second call every, every two seconds or five seconds to get this torrent data. So we've eliminated the overhead of the request response from the, the client to the server, but we're still doing all this server shit. That's not my problem. Basically, for real-time data, you have to do daemon programming. If you Google daemon programming, it's not basic PHP stuff, OK? So you have to have a, a completely different mindset. I see someone nodding in the audience. Um, 
for, for example, if you wanted to do, or if I wanted to do a monitor CPU usage example, and I wanted to have real-time um, data sent to the client, so I would basically display top in Linux in the browser. I would do this the crap way. I would have a Python script that, honestly, I'd do a Python script that runs top, passes the output, and then allows me to display it in the client. Now, if you wanted to do it the proper way, you'd have to do what I've copied and pasted off Google and Stack Overflow. You'd have a C++ binary, query the host resources, MIB, and then you'd have to sleep on a pthread mutex in between, and then it involves threading or something like that. So you'd actually have to do some proper daemon shit here to make it work. So what I learned from this is that and using an event loop is not automatically non-blocking or asynchronous. So the easiest way to not block is to use threads, processes, or an external library. Um, all connections between the client and the server, you can do with SSH using Torify if you want to keep uh, anonymous, if you want. Could have done this with Node.js, but obviously none of us want to sell our soul here. Um, I found out at the end, you could have just made RPC calls to the server to get this torrent data. You didn't have to do this horrible command line shit. Um, and I only found that out right at the end, which, which is unfortunate and often the case. Um, I also think I found out that you don't have to broadcast on a topic. You can, uh, a connection itself has methods that you can send information to over that specific connection. And uh, if you want to do some real server shit, then that's your, your problem. So your choices with WebSockets are React and Ratchet, and PHP and Aries. And PHP is the, like, the latest iteration of this, and it's pretty damn fast. Um, Autoban.js was the client-side library that I used. And libevent and libev are the uh, app get things you have to install to make the uh, event loop happen in C instead of in PHP. Libuv is Windows, but obviously no one uses Windows here because we're all decent developers. Where you can go next, sorry if anyone does use Windows. Um, where you can go next, get a simple example of this working. Uh, use processes first to offload the work like you did with that React process uh, extension thing. Um, watch this talk. Highly recommend this talk for getting a uh, job queue working, and then you can write object-oriented code and have it completely separate from, uh, uh, from the rest of everything. And then you can move on to actual async stuff, which is where you use promises and callback hell and all that sort of stuff in, in the event loop itself. So you can actually do stuff in the event loop without worrying about it. But I didn't do any of that. I just offloaded everything, so it was really easy to keep a nice code base. And uh, have fun, because you're not using Node.js. And uh, so I'm j 7 mbo on Twitter. I do PHP 6 jokes, object-oriented stuff. You have to watch this talk. It's seriously awesome. If you use the knowledge from this talk and the event loop stuff from this, I'll put the slides up, which I already have at the bottom, then you can do some uh, really cool stuff with this sort of stuff. Um, and this is the application that I created in the end with clearly just an Ubuntu torrent here, and this was animated. And thanks for listening. Uh, I think I have time for questions, so does anyone want to berate me? Go for it. Oh, one here. How resilient is the WebSocket connection to changing pages in the web application? So that's a good question. In fact, when I did um, my thing, every time I changed page, I'd have to reinstantiate a WebSocket connection. But uh, which would call on open again and on subscribe, which obviously isn't the best way of doing it. But the way around that, I guess, would be to keep that client in the internal array of clients and then uh, not remove them until a certain timeout has, has disappeared from them not reconnecting or something like that. So you would still have to do the client to the server thing saying we're reestablishing a connection, but that's the only way I can think of unless, yeah, that's basically the only way I could think of doing it. If you've got a better way, I've still got this project on here, so please tell me afterwards. Did you do video streaming on the uh, the other app? Shit. So that you can start so that you can start watching the torrent before you Okay, all right, I'll just be honest with you. So what I did, I might have this cooked at the have end, a actually. So uh, I had an Xbox three sixty, right? And my plan was to download legal, uh, that thing with the bunny, which is completely legal to watch and, and they have torrents, I think you know what it means. And basically, after it had finished downloading, I'd have a button that said convert. And you click convert, it'd do the job in, with FFmpeg in the cloud, and then it would move it to a certain uh, open directory. So I could go on my Xbox 360, go on a browser thing, um, go on Internet Explorer, I think it was, go to a certain URL, and I'd be able to watch that video because it had been converted to webm, .webm. So that's how I would watch it in the browser. So yeah, I'd, I had the whole thing going. So that, yeah, you did see that, Thanks. and it was all legal. <laughs> Fuck. 
Anyone got any questions that don't relate to video stuff? <laughs> what, what other use cases have you seen for WebSockets and maybe people that have used your sort of skeleton to get them going? So I've seen people use WebSockets for news notifications, notifications for the, the server's going to go down soon. Um, that's, I guess that's just a general WebSocket question, but if you are making lots of calls that are polling over and over for data, typically I would look at, you know, maybe is, is WebSockets the right way for that sort of thing. So if you're, if you're doing a uh, set interval in JavaScript and making an AJAX request in that set interval to update a table using data tables or something like that, then I would consider uh, WebSockets as a, as a potential solution. But you've got all the architecture and all that stuff that I've just shown to have to go through. So it depends if you've got the budget, infrastructure, and, and the right architecture mindset to be able to, to sort that out. So uh, it depends. The reason for my previous question is perhaps an answer to that question. Um, I'm already using RabbitMQ to do a lot of processing, some of which can take multiple minutes because of what it's doing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I was asking about how resilient is the web service connection because oftentimes someone will have gone to the page in the application which will trigger that process in the queue. Yep. And I actually want to tell them that it's finished, but they could have navigated to anywhere else in the application at the time. And so it would be great to be able to have that WebSocket connection reopened so that when the process that was already in the queue did finish, they got the notification. Back. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, for, for, for example, if you're using uh, Twig and you've got that uh, templating engine or you've, you've just got an include on every single page that creates that WebSocket connection, yeah. then you would just check to see if that connection still exists or wait until it has before sending that information out. So, yeah, yeah you, can, you can definitely do that. And that would be an answer to that question at the back about what real use could you put it to? Nice. Thank you. No other questions? Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs>